The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho Part 6 They were strange books. They spoke about mercury, salt, dragons and kings, and he didn't understand any of it. But there was one idea that seemed to repeat itself throughout all the books. All things are the manifestation of one thing only. In one of the books, he learned that the most important text in the literature of alchemy contained only a few lines, and had been inscribed on the surface of an emerald. It's the emerald tablet, said the Englishman, proud that he might teach something to the boy. Well then, why do we need these books? the boy asked. So that we can understand those few lines, the Englishman answered, without hearing really to believe what he'd said. The book that most interested the boy told the stories of the famous alchemists. They were men who had dedicated their entire lives to the purification of metals in their laboratories. They believed that if a metal were heated for many years, it would free itself of all its individual properties, and what was left would be the soul of the world. This soul of the world allowed them to understand anything on the face of the earth, because it was the language with which all things communicated. They called that discovery the masterwork. It was part liquid and part solid. Can't you just observe men and omens in order to understand the language? the boy asked. You have a mania for simplifying everything, answered the Englishman, irritated. Alchemy is a serious discipline. Every step has to be followed exactly as it was followed by the masters. The boy learned that the liquid part of the master's work was called the elixir of life, and that it cured all illnesses. It also kept the alchemist from growing old, and the solid part was called the philosopher's stone. It's not easy to find the philosopher's stone, said the Englishman. The alchemists spent years in their laboratories observing the fire that purified the metals. They spent so much time close to the fire that gradually they gave up all the vanities of the world. They discovered that the purification of metals had led to the purification of themselves. The boy thought about the crystal merchant. He had said that it was a good thing for the boy to clean the crystal pieces so that he could free himself from negative thoughts. The boy was becoming more and more convinced that alchemy could be learned in one's daily life. Also, said the Englishman, the philosopher's stone has a fascinating property. A small sliver of the stone can transform large quantities of metal into gold. Having heard that, the boy became even more interested in alchemy. He thought that, with some patience, he'd be able to transform everything into gold. He read the lives of the various people who had succeeded in doing so. Helvetius, Elas, Fulcanelli and Gerber. They were fascinating stories. Each of them lived out his personal legend to the end. They travelled, spoke with wise men, performed miracles for the incredulous, and owned the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. But when the boy wanted to learn how to achieve the master's work, he became completely lost. There were just drawings coded instructions and obscure texts. Why do they make things so complicated? he asked the Englishman one night. The boy had noticed that the Englishman was irritable and missed his books. So that those who have the responsibility of understanding can understand, he said. Imagine if everyone went around transforming lead into gold. 
gold would lose its value. It's only those who are persistent and willing to study things deeply who achieve the master's work. That's why I'm here in the middle of the desert. I'm seeking a true alchemist who will help me to decipher the codes. When were the books written? the boy asked. Oh, many centuries ago. They didn't have the printing press in those days, the boy argued. There was no way for everyone to know about alchemy. Why did they use such strange language? Why so many drawings? The Englishman didn't answer him directly. He said that for the past few days he had been paying attention to how the caravan operated, but he hadn't learned anything new. The only thing he had noticed was that the talk of war was becoming more and more frequent. Then one day, the boy returned the books to the Englishman. Did you learn anything? the Englishman asked, eager to hear what it might be. He needed someone to talk to, so as to avoid thinking about the possibility of war. I learned that the world has a soul, and that whoever understands that soul can also understand the language of things. I learned that many alchemists realised their personal legends and wound up discovering the soul of the world, the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. But above all, I've learned that these things are all so simple that they could be written on the surface of an emerald. The Englishman was disappointed. The years of research, the magic symbols, the strange words and the laboratory equipment... None of this had made an impression on the boy. His soul must be too primitive to understand those things, he thought. He took back his books and packed them away again in their bags. Go back to watching the caravan, he said. That didn't teach me anything either. The boy went back to contemplating the silence of the desert and the sand raised by the animals. Everyone has his or her own way of learning things, he said to himself. His way isn't the same as mine, mine his. But we're both in search of our personal legends, and I respect him for that. The caravan began to travel day and night. The hooded Bedouins reappeared more and more frequently, and the camel driver, who had become a good friend of the boys, explained that the war between the tribes had already begun. The caravan would be very lucky to reach the oasis. The animals were exhausted, and the men talked among themselves less and less. The silence was the worst aspect of night, when the mere groan of a camel, which before had been nothing but the groan of a camel, now frightened everyone, because it might be a signal of a raid. The camel driver, though, seemed not to be very concerned with the threat of war. "'I'm alive,' he said to the boy, and as they ate a bunch of dates one night, with no fire and no moon, "'when I'm eating, that's all I think about. "'If I'm on the march, I just concentrate on marching. "'If I have to fight, it will be just as good a day to die as any other.' Because I don't live in my past nor my future, I'm interested in only the present. If you can concentrate always on the present, you'll be a happy man. You'll see that there is life in the desert, that there are stars in the heavens, and that the tribesmen fight because they are part of the human race. Life will be a party for you, a grand festival, because life is the moment that we're living right now. Two nights later... As he was getting ready to bed down, the boy looked for the star they followed every night. He thought that the horizon was a bit lower than it had been, because he seemed to see stars on the desert itself. It's the oasis, the camel driver said. Well, why don't we go there right now, the boy asked. Because we have to sleep. The boy awoke as the sun rose. There in front of him were the small stars had been the night before, 
was an endless row of date palms stretching across the entire desert. "'We've done it,' said the Englishman, who was already awake. But the boy was quiet. He was at home with the silence of the desert, and he was content just to look at the trees. He still had a long way to go to reach the pyramids, and some day, this morning, would just be a memory. But this was a present moment, the party the camel driver had mentioned, and he wanted to live it as he did the lessons of his past and his dreams of the future. Although the visions of the date palms would some day be just a memory, right now it signified shade and water and a refuge from war. Yesterday, the camel's groan signalled danger, and now a row of date palms could herald a miracle. The world speaks many languages, the boy thought. The times rushed past, and so the caravans, thought the alchemist, as he watched the hundreds of peoples and animals arriving at the oasis. People were shouting at the new arrivals. Dust obscured the desert sun, and the children of the oasis were bursting with excitement at the arrival of the strangers. The alchemists saw the tribal chiefs greet the leader of the caravan and converse with them at length. But none of that mattered to the alchemist. He had already seen many people come and go, and the desert remained as it was. He had seen kings and beggars walking in the desert sands. The dunes were changing constantly by the wind, yet these were the same sands that he had known since he had been a child. He always enjoyed seeing the happiness of the traveller's excitement when, after weeks of yellow sand and blue sky, they first saw the green of the date palms. Maybe God created the desert so that man could appreciate the date trees, he thought. He decided to concentrate on more practical matters. He knew that in the caravan there was a man to whom he was to teach some of his secrets. The omens had told him so. He didn't know the man yet, but his practiced eye would recognise him when he appeared. He hoped that it would be someone as capable as his previous apprentice. I don't know why these things have to be transmitted by word of mouth, he thought. It wasn't exactly that they were secrets. God reveals his secrets easily to all his creatures. He had only one explanation for this fact. Things have to be transmitted this way because they were made up from pure life, and this kind of life cannot be captured in pictures or words. Because people become fascinated with pictures and words and wind up forgetting the language of the world. The boy couldn't believe what he was seeing. The oasis, rather than being just a well surrounded by a few palm trees, as he had seen once in a geography book, was much larger than many towns back in Spain. There were 300 wells, 50,000 date trees, and innumerable coloured tents spread among them. It looks like a thousand and one nights, said the Englishman impatient to meet with the alchemist. They were surrounded by children, curious to look at the animals and the people that were arriving. The men of the oasis wanted to know if they had seen fighting, and the women competed with one another for access to the cloth and the precious stones brought by the merchants. The silence of the desert was a distant dream. The travellers in the caravan were talking incessantly, laughing and shouting, as if they had emerged from a spiritual world and found themselves once again in a world of people. They were relieved and happy. They had been taking careful precautions in the desert, but the camel driver explained to the boy that oases were always considered to be natural territories because the majority of the inhabitants were women and children. There were oases throughout the desert, but the tribesmen fought in the desert, leaving the oasis as a place of refuge. With some difficulty, the leader of the caravan brought all his people together and gave them his instructions. 
The group was to remain there at the oasis until the conflict between the tribes was.